The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Deer Grow. Man, it's almost food plot season, Jared, and Deer Grow is one of those products that has really changed the way that we plant food plots and the success we've seen from them. No doubt. I've been, you know, trying to plant food plots my, my entire you know, whitetail hunting career, which is a little shorter than yours, but the minute that I started or that I, you know, I realized that I could get Deer Grow back into some of these remote plots where I couldn't get lime or fertilizer, especially in the 50 pound bag, you know, format, mm-hmm. so everything was changed. You know, I could get into these spots uh, moving forward with a, with a backpack sprayer and that's since escalated to these 40 or 60 uh, gallon sprayers and we're doing upwards of you know five to ten acre food plots just with your grow and having phenomenal success yeah and i mean with the price of fertilizer lime diesel everything this year i mean what better way to get in there and grow a successful food plot at about a third of the cost check out deer grow at deergrow.com and we're back hey on our podcast episode 129 nick still in vegas don't know if he's coming back at this point <laughs> Uh, hopefully he didn't lose his airfare. His airfare? Laid it, laid it all out on the table. No. Put it on black. He'd be calling us. Yeah, probably. <laughs> he's, yeah. Got his, he's got his woman there to keep him honest. Yeah, too. that's true. That's true. Uh, it is May the 18th. Still middle of May. <clears throat> Still in this funk of middle of May. Yep. Um, you know, it's uh, about as far away from the end of last season and the beginning of next season for our, for deer hunting as we get. We're on the dark side of the moon. Yeah, so we're, we're about to turn the corner. Uh, summer's ahead, velvet's ahead, fun stuff ahead. Everything's ahead of us. That's it. That's how we got to look at it. Glass yeah. half full. Off-season project. I mean, we're, uh, we are we talked a lot this morning on the last podcast, I guess, about um, our, our our corn and, uh, mm-hmm. and bean plots that have been going in here and... Uh, uh, it's still a little too early for cameras too. I've got mineral mm-hmm. out, but I I'm, I'm, I try to hold. I I threw those two out just because I can't figure out how to cancel the subscription on those other two. But that will happen. Um, I, I suppose probably before any of that really starts, we're gonna get into. I believe we have some new bows coming. We do, we do. We um, I mean, we've had a partnership with Hoyt um, basically since since the inception of Hunter. I would assume. Give or take. Yeah. Uh, and so we're going to continue that relationship. Um, and, yeah, we're currently both shooting RX-5s right now. Um, but we're going to – we'll change up. I'm not sure if we'll end up in the RX-7s or where, where we'll be here in the in the next few weeks. But, yeah, we've got some new bows coming, which means back to the, the drawing boards a bit, which is kind of fun. Like the reset up of a new bow, getting everything back together, getting your bearings on everything, building arrows – um to me that that kind of is june and july for me like it's mm-hmm. still hunting is so far away it's, that it's I'm, always too late no, no matter when you start doing it it's yeah you're, you're behind it <clears throat> we are i mean you know in a best case scenario we'd be going into just shooting and and maybe even shooting year round you know it's just the bow goes away it doesn't come back out until summer you know so i i like that june for me it's june and july it's when i'm trying to get everything ready for the bow build arrows. And then that way, like August, I'm shooting my setup. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to be sighting in, in August. I want to just be shooting in the evening. Sightings into, that's the easy part. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, especially with a new bow. I knew, I mean, it's just making sure that everything is, is tuned and is, you know, I don't know. It's kind of a, it's a reset as more than anything. It's Mm -hmm. like, you know, a a bow is a bow these days. I mean, all the technology is, is fairly consistent. You know, they do some small new things every year, but Mm -hmm. Personal preferences, I think, is where it comes down to on, you know, bow manufacturer yeah, type if you're of bow, change anything, carbon, be- aluminum, et cetera. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, comes down to personal preference. And, and transparently, I don't like changing bows that often um, just because, you know, when you really engrave yourself into a bow and, you know, becomes an extension of you. And so there was a point in time where I think you and I changed quite a bit, um, not necessarily manufacturers, but just different types of bows. And so, you know there's always that kind of anxiety of like, well, you know, I'm shooting really good with my last bow. What's this new setup going to be like? Mm-hmm. So, um, I guess our guest today, we've had on the podcast before, go back a year and a half ish, maybe, uh, ATA show. Mm-hmm. Uh, we sat down with Daryl and Troy, um, talking, you know, basically everything, what we were just discussing, you know, and, and really kind of hovering around that arrow, flight, build, penetration side of things. Because, you know, as crazy as it seems, you know, that topic seems just as hot now as it did a year and a half ago when we were sitting at ATA show having this discussion. 
Uh, and you still have the guys who will say, you know, lighter, faster. You have the people that will say, you know, heavier, more momentum. You'll have the single bevel, you know, you'll have the fix. You'll have the mechanicals. There's this just, it's probably in the archery category, right? I would say it's probably the most debatable piece that's that's out there from a gear perspective <clears throat> probably the um, most the most debated because and it's the, because the mechanical versus uh, yeah it mechanical is, it is crazy is that it's still exi- it's just like there is no there is no right answer is the no. reason that that debate still exists yeah it is i mean it, you know we probably people listen to this you probably killed a, a deer with both at some point in time you have a personal preference now or what you believe is is a better performing uh function but I mean, I've killed plenty of deer with fixed. You know, that's what I started off with. I've killed plenty of deer with mechanical. Um, you know, and we'll we'll get into again some of our personal preference here and why. But you know, obviously with Troy and Daryl's background, they're going to bring a lot more than just kind of our experience um, side of things in in terms of what the actual flight of the arrow. Um, you know, looking at the the differences between you know light and heavy arrows. FOC, uh, and then ultimately, you know, what do you got on the tip? It's it's a good refresher. It's a good time of year to like as you're if you're considering, you know, if you're making a switch to a new bow or just you know starting to make make arrows again or looking to to improve something or change something. Um, you know, I don't know. We, we can get a refresher from these guys and and maybe because uh, because you can never have the perfect setup, right? And so you can always be yeah. you can always be tweaking, always be trying to figure something else out so hopefully hopefully we'll learn something here I, I will say that there's probably i you know it's hard to put a number on it there are probably a lot of people um at this time in the year as you're getting ready to get you know the new gear ready for the new season that are switching because of something that maybe wasn't even gear responsible last year it's probably user error uh, usually is and so i think that's <laughs> a big of the time. that's a big part of this discussion is you get a lot of people that you know had something happen again likely user error and immediately you're gonna say well i gotta change mm-hmm. you know and maybe we try to pull some logic together of like is there uh you know a happy medium Where, where's the middle ground where's the this is where you should go or is it different for everybody so yeah, I think ac- accurate analysis of like problems that you've experienced in the past is like the, the most critical thing when it comes to like to pivoting. Like if you're gonna, if you're going to make a decision to change something, you should really understand why something happened. And I think like when it comes to deer hunting and certainly you know things that are happening with your bow and and broadhead malfunctions and stuff, it's like but there's probably s- such a misunderstanding or or so many decisions are made based off of like oh it's, it was this mm-hmm. or it was that, and it's like really mostly it? It, it should probably be self fault. Yeah. So anyways, let's bring in Troy and Daryl. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Hoyt Archery. Dude, where would we be without our Hoyt bows? Probably shooting crossbows. <laughs> or, or a Matthews. <laughs> yeah. One in the same. Yeah. But in all seriousness, we love being Hoyt guys because you stand out. When you're in this room full of other people that shoot these other types of bows, I feel like the Hoyt guys just stick out. Uh, Dude, it's just a legit bow. I mean, th- th- especially that carbon riser, man. I mean, I-, I know that they've got several other aluminum lines as well. But for, for me, I'm shooting that RX-5 uh, in the carbon model. They've since come out with the RX-7. And uh, I can't tell you how much I love being a Hoyt guy amongst a C4 of Matthews guys. So we're out there, I think, pr- proving them wrong, shooting 80 pounds and uh, you know, killing stuff. Hey, man, if you want to get serious, get Hoyt. Good to have you guys back on. I mean, last time we were kind of all just sitting around the table at ATA, you know, uh, shooting the shit essentially. And so no beer this time, no beer this time, you know, and, and the little virtual aspect of things. But, uh, again, appreciate you guys, uh, coming back on here to talk about this. I mean, it, you know, it, I admittedly, right. Probably the first, I don't know, 10 to 15 years of my archery career, this discussion was probably never even in inside of my brain, right? It was literally what I had grown up shooting, you know, maybe even what my dad had shot and just that that's kind of what I went out in the field with. Um, and now just with the advent of so much information out there about these topics and just so much chatter about these topics, you know, for the serious bow hunter, I think it's almost inevitable that you have to have some sort of, you know, consciousness around these topics. It, I found out. I found in the intro. It was interesting. Y'all are talking about how 
aero system seem to be a one of the top topics being chattered about now. I don't, I don't, you know, get on the message boards much or anything. I have, I have white eyes right now because I just spent three days fishing. <laughs> <and> I'm sunburned. <laughs> but so May is wonderful for me. Yeah. See, there you go. I'm fishing like a madman, right? Um, why do you think um, it's such a big topic? I mean, why did that happen? I mean. Where'd this come from? I mean, it's just, yeah. I'm with you. We just shot whatever dad had or whatever. That's it. I'm really old, right? Yeah. You I mean, be my kid. So, well, that's just how it back. was though, man. I mean, it was, it was just, you, you kind of, this is what you had, right? There weren't many, there weren't even many choices out there to begin with, you know? I mean, mm. um, you know, my joke with my dad all the time, like he was shooting like, you know, Magnus stingers, like back in the day, you know, on double yep. X 75s. And like, that's just what it was. You know, I think that like anything in this industry, um, you know, we are probably, you know, one of, if not the most gear uh, centric groups of hunters, um, just because, you know, frankly, you just, you can't just get away with things in, in a bow hunting situation in most cases. Uh, sure. I mean, there, there are guys that will go out there and make their own longbow by hand and go out there and, and kill a deer this year. Um, but yep. I think from a standpoint of the gear aspect of things, you know, because we're so passionate about it, I think it almost leans us forward to want to find more or overanalyze well, it. Yeah, I, I think too that there's like, um, uh, there, there's so many options and so like little understanding that it, it, it opens mm -hmm. us up for uh you know marketing people to take advantage uh, maybe not take advantage but like yeah play you could, on you it. could say whatever you want and people are like yep like i you know i, I could see that i could see yeah. why you yeah. know and, and it's it's i think it's funny that like when, when you talk about broadheads you know and arrows maybe a different category but like you know you essentially have like uh mechanicals and fixed heads like as if it's like uh you know a Democratic or, or Republican. It's like, it's not, there's not just two of them. It's like, there's literally hundreds, if not thousands of different broadhead designs that like could be critiqued and have advantages and disadvantages. And, uh, yeah, I, I just don't think people, people know they got on the bandwagon with a marketing or, or somebody told them about it at some point. And there's a few that have like risen to the top, you know, you try, I know you've got a few, uh, that, that you really prefer. And, and Jeremy and I do as well, just based off of really experience more than anything, but mm -hmm. You know, yep. of the hundreds or thousands of designs, you know, we've probably tried five or ten of them, right? Yep. Tops. Oh, easily. Yeah, and that, that's, I mean, y you can't, right? I mean, because there's so much that goes into a setup in a performance aspect of things, you know, to, to kind of just continue to change, continue to change. It's, it's tough to build a, a, you know, essentially rhythm and consistency when you're, you're essentially trying to improve your skill. Again, we talked about the human and, or user error earlier, trying to improve your ability to make a lethal shot on an animal. So you don't want, you know, in a hunting situation to continue to be changing things. You want to find what works and what you feel works and, and kind of commit to it. Yeah. Daryl, what do you think? Daryl just got a bow, which I've told him is the worst thing on earth. I wanted him stupid. Don't yeah. get a bow. Um, Cause man. then you become one of I'm those idiots I mean, and you're not fresh. Yeah. This is so, <laughs> What's your perspective this on this? Because you, I mean, you're an insider now, but you're an outsider yeah. still. Yeah. So this is a very appropriate conversation for uh, for me to have with you guys and others, uh, because I just got a bow and I just got it set up, and I'm shooting in the backyard, and and uh, you know, issues are are starting to reveal themselves. <laughs> Arrows aren't flying as straight as I would like. This and, sucks, Daryl. I've told uh, you. I wanted you stupid forever. A <laughs> little different in the real world, huh, Daryl? <laughs> well, I'll tell you. He's so, like, in theory. So in I theory. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. I put my Poindexter hat or take it <laughs> off here for just a minute. And two things I've learned, really. Uh, and number one is a good bow shop is your friend. Yes. And, no uh, and I, I say that because, uh, I mean, even to, to look at a bow and, and realize that it's a complicated piece of machinery and for it to be in tune or out of tune, I really wouldn't know, you know, I wouldn't know if it was set up right. So to take it in, to have somebody look it over, to install a peep 
on it, a peep side if that's your preference or a kisser button or whatever. Uh, these are things that uh, I wouldn't know how to do, but uh, it, someone else does and I want to get that experience from them rather than you know spend several months trying to figure it out on my own. Mm -hmm. So that has really, uh, I've really taken advantage of that and I, I can't recommend that highly enough uh, if you have a good shop. Uh, to take advantage of it. And then the second thing is just something that I have uh, said before I ever started shooting my own boat is that it's very difficult to tell what the arrow is doing as you're trying to watch it from from the bow to the target. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's almost like you let the you let the arrow go and next thing you know it's in the target and you've seen nothing about how it's how it comes off the bow, how it flies through the air. Or how it uh, how it uh, behaves when it impacts? Is it straight impact? Does it does it come in sideways and then straighten up, or does it does it vibrate when it hits the target quite a bit? Those are things that you don't really think about because basically you walk down there and you pick your arrows out of the target and you come back and you shoot again mm -hmm. uh, because you really can't see them. And and I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I fire probably twenty or thirty shots a day right now. Just trying to build my muscles up to uh, be able to draw the bow back comfortably, and uh, the whole time my mind is focused on just trying to pull the shot off. I'm not thinking about how the arrow is flying or what's going on, uh, and so it, it occurs to me that uh, if you had a camera and you're able to put the camera behind yourself and watch the arrow at about 120 frames per second or something like that, there. There's a ton of information that we're overlooking that we would we would never consider until we see that video afterwards to take a look at it. And we found that true in testing, and I'm starting to see that even in my own shooting in the backyard. Mm -hmm. That I really don't know what's going on. Yeah. Right? From my from my own launching the arrow, I don't I I can't uh, uh, have intuition about what's going on because I don't know if the arrow is hitting the table strings or or the rest is not falling correctly. All I know is I let go, and the arrow most of the time hits the target. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think one of the craziest things we've all seen all is we were jacking around with the high speed camera, and I shot a bear shaft 300 spine arrow with a 300 grain field point just to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. And it tore in the paper about 15 inches. Wow. Okay, so. When I saw the tear, and I'm thinking 300, it was an aluminum insert, so 315 total grains up front. You got to think it was probably flying like that, nose down, yeah. right? It's super heavy. You would be wrong. It flew nose up. up. Just we from the bend. The and... He saw it. Hmm. The first flip shot, he goes, hey, wow, it's nose up. Do you know why he saw it? Because he didn't have any, he hadn't shot a bow much. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't out of his realm of possibility that the arrow could, that the, brought, the uh, shaft could do anything. Right. My mind said, yeah. under, a little under spine, well, a lot under spine for a 300 grain point. Sure. It's got to go. Yeah, down. Knock high. Yep. Right? Point down. Mm hmm No. It flew almost perfect at about a 35 degree angle. It didn't wiggle or anything. It launched, it went up, and it flew huh. like, and then hit the paper. <laughs> That's it didn't, crazy. It didn't wave. Yeah. And who'd have ever thought that? Yeah. Right? And then we put a little yeah, fletching on it. Those. And it, it almost shot a bullet hole. Hmm. Just enough to stabilize that flight. Well, remember, yeah. this is one of the things that Daryl's taught me. That shaft wants to fly point up, fletching or not. So it's going to launch point up, and the fletching is going to correct it. Hmm. Right? Obvious. That's why it almost shot a bullet hole mm -hmm. with a fletching. Yep. But when you put a fixed blade broadhead on the front of it, you've introduced a, de a device that's actually catching wind. Catching it, yeah. So you've got that. We didn't do that. But from our testing, you should see crazy arrow flight because it wants to launch up. Mm -hmm. It's trying the to self tries correct to stabilize, it. Yep. And then the broadhead says, no, mm -hmm. I'm going to do some other crap. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it might have done a whirly bird. It, yeah, so right? I was going to say, in, in that situation, well, I mean, are you are you expecting that to have, you know, uh, yeah, some sort of twist tail out, or are you expecting to see just more oscillation of it, you know, constantly trying to self-correct itself up, down, up, down type of thing? I believe with or without from the, the other stuff we'd see with, bending, huh? With oh, fletching. With fletching. With fletching. Yeah. yeah. I I Go think ahead, it bro. would do it could do I think it could do multiple things. That's one thing I have learned through bear shafting and knock tuning every single bear shaft and then fletching them. Yep. Is that I have built a set of arrows, twelve or eighteen, that are absolutely as close together as they possibly can be. Yeah. And when I used to, in the old days, I'd go to the shop and shoot a fletched arrow, and we move the rest around and mess with it, and we get a bullet hole with fletching. And I literally had numbers on my arrows, and I did not know that I was numbering the inconsistency hmm. of the set. Mm -hmm. So number one. Flew great. Number two was a eh. mm -hmm. three was a eh. and then five and seven with a broad head were, ah, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You send it at a rabbit and yeah. hope it hits the rabbit, but you're not hitting anything square. Yeah. So the camera has been phenomenal. Yeah. I mean, that's got to be really huge, fun. a yeah, huge piece right. of it. Uh, you know, I would have to imagine, and, and again, maybe you know, obviously we've got two different categories here. We've got, you know, what I would consider like the archers, right? And and frankly, a lot of your, your pro shooters and stuff, very in tune with their gear, their bow. Then you've got the bow hunting side of things, which Jared and I pretty much fall on. I, I would yep. imagine that, you know, a lot of people on the bow hunting side are shooting underspined arrows. You think that's, that's likely? I would say about 90% of people are. Yeah. Because they're going fast. Exactly. Well, why would you so, assume that? Because of, of speed. What do you mean? So you can lighten up the arrow. Mm -hmm. So a 400 spine arrow is only, you know, seven or eight grains per inch, whereas a 250 is pushing nine or 10. Mm -hmm. So they're just trying to reduce mass to go fast. Mm -hmm. And then in turn is under spine then for, for what they're right. shooting. So then the shafts are under spine. Yeah. Pretty typical. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's just so the way the mindset that, is out there. That, yeah, and that would sort of lend itself to a mechanical broadhead being able to fly uh, in that scenario much better. So people, if they had that same setup and they unscrewed their mechanical broadhead and put the same grain weight uh, fixed blade broadhead on, they're going to uh, probably experience some problems with that because the arrow is flexing as it's flying down range. It's generating lift in some direction, maybe not up, maybe sideways, mm -hmm. maybe down, whatever. Uh, but it would be very difficult to, ex it would be very uh, unusual for you to get the same flight performance out of those two systems as the two different systems, mm -hmm. right? But that's, yeah. but that's what uh, the, uh, community would believe the marketing would lead you to believe that that's all you have to do. And that's unfortunately not correct. That's not uh, good information. Mm -hmm. what, what would have caused like, you know, that situation you're describing earlier, Troy, where it was like, you know, uh, whipping 15 inches in, in one direction without fletching. Is that just because it's underspined? Yes, it's because the shaft was underspined. Okay. You'd need a 200 spine there shaft to fly that pointer, or 250. Yeah, and so but, what was it? Was it consistently throwing it in the same direction then? Yeah, we did it like two or three times. Wow. It did the same way every time. And so what? That, we, now, let me let me clarify something though. Sure. It was that single arrow. We shot that right. arrow. Right. So if I would have grabbed another exact arrow that was 300 spine it was exactly the same but it was a different arrow it may bend differently mm -hmm. and and so is because that it's not tuned to the same spike spot and is that like based off of uh yeah, like in if, fact if, if you would twist that shaft uh you know twist the knock in the shaft like call it 45 degrees mm -hmm. would that uh would that tear follow that it wouldn't continue to shoot the same way right I can't answer that question because I have not done it, but the, but every, when I've done not tuning on my own arrows, yes. So yeah. well, what, in the what, scenario with the ridiculous point 
on a moderately mm -hmm. underspined arrow that we're talking about, which is extreme. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's just, we did it for shits and giggles, literally. I said, I just want to see what happens, right? Um, but when I, I bear shaft and knock tune every single arrow I get. So I've seen some, I'll have one tear an inch left, rotate the knock, and it'll go to the right. Yeah. Or up or down. Which would make sense, sudden, right? Because something is yep. dictating. It's, it's not just that it's underspined, so it's... Yeah, there's still a, some consistency to it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There is. There is some consistency. I would agree with to that, it. Troy. You may remember that. Yeah, you may remember that we did shoot a 250 spine, I believe, arrow in that same set of tests, and that uh, tear nose left. Do you remember yeah. that? Uh -huh. <laughs> we shot the right just a little bit yeah. later on in the second series of tests. We we took the same. The same situation with the same nose tip, and uh, which was 300, 300 grains or so, and uh, shot a different spine arrow several of those, or several times, the same arrow several times, and it was consistent, but it was not, it was nose left every time. So, um, yeah, the uh, there's there's a lot going on there. That's not just the bow, as you can tell, right? That's right, that's the projectile, because the bows, bows are pretty stupid. Mm -hmm. They do one thing. Just one thing. They return to static state. Yep. Mm -hmm. you, uh, now, you can torque them. Sure. That's the monkey holding the bow. User error. Yeah. You can mess with them. You can actually bend them and all that stuff and make them, make, you know, put twist the cams and strings and yokes and whatever, to whatever system you've got and tune it in to try to push the arrow differently. But I want to touch on something on the under spine thing. Um. I don't, do we have video or is this just audio? No, it's video. Okay, so some somebody's going to see us? They yeah. see you. Yeah, you look, you look great. Trust me. Yeah, right. I, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> I don't have anything. Okay, so. You do have a little something right there. Arrow, <laughs> when you shoot an underspined arrow, it'll launch and bend yep. a lot. Well, yep. It also does this all the way down the shot line. Right. And it doesn't settle very quickly. Yep. Here's what's terrifying. If you get a 12 yard shot, your arrow is likely to be bent like a banana hmm. and hit the target and it's bent mm -hmm. in flight. Mm -hmm. Well, when it hits a target, that energy is going to go in the direction of a bend and the back of the arrow is going to whip if it's not stabilized. Yeah. So you're going super fast. And let's say you can get a fixed blade of broadhead to fly. The arrow's bent pretty yeah. significantly at impact and hasn't stabilized at all or isn't stabilizing on mm -hmm. a short shot. Like, you know, you're, everybody's wishing for 12 yards at that deer you've been hunting. Yeah. Nobody wants to shoot 40. Yeah. Nobody does. Everybody wants 12 broadside right there. Just walk. Yep. Right? I'm damn good at 12. I can kill the hell out of stuff at 12. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. I'm a genius at that distance. <laughs> So, um, it's, it's a pretty scary impact concept that n I've never heard anyone discuss except for me and Daryl, that the arrow is bent in the air. So when that, when that impact, impact is made, then Troy, is it, let's say, you know, hypothetically bent up, right? As I make that shot, is that momentum going to carry that penetration upward versus through the vitals as I would like? It's going to kill it. When I've shot targets trying to catch this on video, the, the shaft goes like this. Yeah. It waves like a flag. Yep. Now that I've said it to you, you're going to start seeing it. Sure. Especially with mechanical broadheads, because think about this. Okay. Let's say, let's say the blades are this way. Mm -hmm. But the arrow's bent that way. Yep. So the blades hit horizontal, but the arrow's bent this direction. You've got energy going in like three different directions. Yeah, it's just sucking the, the hell out it's of it. It's just sucking the wind out of it, mm -hmm. right? And thank God I met Daryl because I never under... He, he told me this. You understand what you're doing, but you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Sure. He's a lot nicer than that. <laughs> but... um. I knew what I was seeing when I was doing this stuff, but I couldn't explain it. Yeah. I shoot a lot of animals a year compared to everybody else, just because I set them up. I got the deer feeders. It's a test lab. I'm not hunting. 
I am testing aero platforms. Mm -hmm. I promise you a 1,035 grand aero, and I've done it twice, goes right through them like they're not there. It is amazing how efficient that system is. But seeing them, uh, I knew why I, I knew I wasn't getting the penetration I should get at 16 yards. And I just couldn't explain it. To y'all's point in the intro, y'all said there's a lot of, we're trying to understand yeah. things mm -hmm. between launch and impact. Yes. And as Daryl said, I'm sure he's got millions of ideas going through his head now that he's actually pulling the trigger. Mm -hmm. It's different Yeah. when you're behind the bow and it looks good. Well, yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, most of us as bow hunters listening, especially deer hunters, we're shooting 30 and in, right? Well, any a, a yeah. modern day bow at 30 yards, that stuff comes off the bow and is in the target pretty damn fast. For you it's to fast. process yeah. right. what happened, let, let's put it this way. If you're seeing something happen like that, there's something significantly wrong. Most, like, most you can see it. Most guys it's don't even bad. know what deer they shot. And they watched it for five it's minutes before bad. they shot it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Well, there's that, and then right. Right. There's, there is some bias in your brain that if you have okay tuned arrows, your brain sees it as good because mm -hmm. if they're moderately accurate, you think they're flying good. <laughs> So, mm -hmm. Troy, just if, for a, a, a large step back, because a, a majority of our listeners are average bow hunter guys, right? I mean, they're, they're yep. deer hunters, yep. they're bow hunter guys. Walk mm -hmm. us through briefly a, if, if somebody says, all right, I want to start fresh, I want a fresh start, your, your bear shaft knock tuning, what do they need to do? What, what, is in, what is all involved for them in that approach to get started down the right path? Okay, so what is your what's your bow specs? And I'll just I'll tell you what to do, and everybody else can hear us. Okay. And so I'm shooting, work that. shooting seventy pounds, twenty nine and three quarter uh, arrow. Um, what are we at? Like four eighty five, probably mm -hmm. four eighty five in terms of total grains on that arrow. And what about Arch Arnold Schwarzenegger over there? What's our strapping young weightlifter? Dude, I, shooting, I'm, like, I'm off by a, I'm off by a hundred grains. I'm pretty sure I need to go back and reweigh my. They're either four eighty five or five eighty. I don't think they're five eighty five. Then they're 485. Yeah. Maybe almost 500 grains. And he's shooting 80 pounds. 80 pounds. Okay. So you're both shooting 80 pounds? No, I'm shooting 70. I'm, I'm shooting like or just two, a strapping fellow. Yeah. There. Strap. Yeah. He's going 80. He wants 90. Can you, can you guys, Troy, can you, only, pounds. can you only see what we see, Troy? Like, you just see my left arm here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I saw it. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, <laughs> it's hard to mess. I know. Mess. No I mean, can, can you see our faces here? <laughs> yeah. You can, okay. For us, it's cut off. We just see, like, my left arm. <laughs> yeah, no, I can see you guys. Right. So well, I'm going to go with 70 pounds and 30 inches, uh, 29 yep. inches roughly, yep. okay? Yep. He goes, yep. Yeah, I so saw it. <laughs> if you really wanted to walk through it and go with a moderately decent arrow mm -hmm. weight, okay? Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll just talk about 500 to 550, somewhere in there. Okay, yep. I would um, actually get 250 spine arrows, and I would get 100... 125 and 150 grain field points mm -hmm. and i would bear i would shoot all three field points through paper and see what the bending rate is for each field point on a 250 to, shaft going, right and then if it tears under a half inch rotate the knock on each one and shoot it so you're if trying one to tears find an that inch and a half and one tears half an inch, take the inch and a half out. So you're trying to find that, that the weak spot in the arrow as you're turning that knock. For no, the we're trying to get it to bullet hole. We're trying to make it, we're trying to match it up with your launcher. So what is, what is rotating the knock actually doing there in that theory? It's, it's changing the way the arrow bends. Got so it. You, when you rotate the knock, you, it may be bending left. Yep. You rotate the knock and it'll bend up or it'll bend perfectly straight. You know, it'll, it'll launch straight her. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because there's a spine in the arrows. There's a, there's a edge, there's a seam in there that's stiff. Got it. That's, well, that's the root of the just, question I was asking earlier when you had that yep. 15 inch flyer. So that mm -hmm. helps. Right, right, right. So there's a, there's a spine in there that's stiff. A lot of people think you should shoot stiff up always. Well, that's bullshit. Not every bow shoots the same. It doesn't shoot as hard as the other ones. Right. There's faster ones and slower ones at 70 pounds. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. 
the THP bow that I'm shooting right now, the Adapt, that thing is just a launcher, man. It's nice and smooth. It's not going to blow your socks off for speed. Right. And it's 70 pounds. And then your bow is going to light it up compared to that one because mm -hmm. it's so much faster. Mm -hmm. Right. I have my Elite's 70 pounds, way faster than that thing. Yep. So the poundage doesn't matter as much as matching the ammo Got it. to your launcher. Okay. And that's exactly what I would do. And I would look at the results and go, oh, wow. So with that you said, know? I wouldn't be surprised if I'm underspined a little bit because I'm shooting 350s right now. Well, so, no, you're, way, you're underspined. Well, so what would be and, a, No, you're shooting 300. Am I? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Are they 300? Yeah. Well, that's terrifying. You guys are tough guy bow hunters, man. No, you know, I think they're go, 350s. Right this right shit. I'm shooting 250s. I'm, I'm, shooting, shooting, I'm shooting Victory VAP 250s. You're mine's shooting are Victory Rip. Rip TKO. 350s. Do they make 350s? I thought yeah. it was a 300. Yeah, no. they make 350s and 400s and everything else. Do they yeah. make 300s? Yeah. You're shooting a 300. Am I? Yeah. I was thinking 300. That's yeah. terrifying. Come on, guys. I know. Is it really? <laughs> Why? That you don't know? Well, yeah, I know. No, I'm off on it. Yeah, this this goes back to the beginning conversation of like, hey, June's coming up. I got to well, get my bow it's, back it's, out. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. We need to we need to get them out here. But a part of it is this this <laughs> mindset of of the reset here of like, OK, because I, I mean, I know when we first looked at it, I looked at going 250 and I was like, ah, that's too much. Like, I don't need to be. Yep. I don't need to be there. Yep. I went I went to the 250s because I'm shooting at. 80. 80 pounds, 80 pounds yeah. and i've got like yeah. like you were saying about the 100 150 200 grain field point up front i've got like an ethics uh you know an outsert system a hybrid mm -hmm. outsert system um and i don't i don't remember what it is exactly but i think it adds like 75 ish grains to maybe 100 ish mm -hmm. grains to my 100 grain field point uh, and the reason okay. i i have a 100 grain field point is because i want options of broadheads like they just don't make very many you know 150 grain uh broadheads um and so the 250 seemed to make sense for me. I, I don't, I can't say I necessarily know why other than. And <laughs> that's I, that's that was, what I was, that's that, where I'm going with this kind of discussion back and forth is like the whys of. Well, that's going to be my question of like, uh, you know. We're going to ask, we're going to ask the, we're going to ask our DOD scientist over here why a stiffer stick flying in the air might be beneficial. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, well, good. I'm glad you did because uh, I want to go back and, and comment on a couple of things here that we've already brought up. If that arrow is flexing in flight, it, it got that way because the bow uh, launched it. Basically, you're launching a long rod from the back end. Right. right? And it begins to bow up. It's going to carry that. It's not going to lose that in flight. It's going to carry that bowing motion back and forth. And this is where the real, where the like 120 frames per second camera comes in. But you can really start to see that. Um, now, when it hits the target, you think, oh, well, that'll straighten it out. But what the target really does is it, it dumps energy back into the arrow to increase that amplitude to at least as much as it got when it hit the when it came off of the bow. Mm -hmm. So it amplifies that the uh, amount of flex that you have just because it it's hit the target. It, you're, you you stopped it really quick and it, it has to right. go up to absorb that energy that it gets when it's trying to stop. What that means is that the nose of that of that broadhead is going to come off. I mean, so the nose of the arrow is going to be bent from the direction that the arrow is flying. Mm -hmm. And of course, once it once it goes into a target, it's going to arrows always fly. It's just flying through meat. If that if that arrow blade if the if the mechanical is opened up or the fixed blade broadhead is pointed down with arrows trying to go straight it's going to go in the direction that 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 broadhead is flying it and so if the if the arrow broadhead itself is not straight when it hits the target it's going to it's going to go in the direction that the that the arrowhead steers it and and so that does it in flight and it does it when it's flying through meat as yeah. well how, how often so, do you think that happens daryl in, in like the in in an average bow hunter situation, we just talked about you know including myself. A lot of us are probably shooting under spined arrows, so we're going to have that you know oscillation in the arrow probably pretty significant. I'm sure there's a lot of people here that are saying to themselves, well, you know, I've had those deer where I thought I you know crushed it. I thought it was you know 12 ring, and well, it just I don't know what it's happened. It's going to result in a lack of penetration, right? It, well, I mean, Daryl's saying it, yeah, it's going to kind of also drive it down. 
Like if it's if it's pointed down, it's it, the arrow is going to want to follow the channel that that broadhead is cutting. So if it's pointed down, yeah. that's it, it's going right. to go that way. It could come out. It could it could it go in and uh, it can go in any direction that the arrow happens to be flexing. Because remember, the arrow is also rotating. Yep. Due to the fletching as it's going. So you I, really I use this analogy. It's you'd be better off thinking about jumping rope and running sideways at the same time. Jeez. Mm -hmm. That's what the arrow's doing. Your left, mm -hmm. if you're going left, your left hand's the broad head and your right hand's the knock. Mm -hmm. And if it's flexing a lot and flying, it's rotating. Yep. It's like jumping rope and running left. Yep. Yeah. So if, let me if let me it's go back really bending. Answer. If it's really bending. Yeah, so let me answer the question. The arrow is always bending. You can always assume it's it's bending when it comes off the bow, even for heavier spine. The heavier, uh, I'm sorry, um, the lower spine arrows means it's bending less. It doesn't have the same amount of bend. It might bend just a little bit mm -hmm. and flex when it's going down range, as opposed to like a 350 spine, which might bend a lot, especially if you're under spine and you're driving it with a with a high poundage bow. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's you can always assume it's going to flex. That's just the way it is. So you control the amount of flex by the tuning and by the arrow choice by the spine. Uh, in my opinion, for compound bows, it's very difficult to be over spine. I was going to just ask that question. Is, is it possible to be overspined? I haven't seen I any problems so. shooting um, really heavy spine arrows, like 200 spine arrows that are theoretically for a 100-pound draw weight. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any problem with it. They're just, they just get really – they get ridiculously heavy, and I would rather shoot a lighter GPI arrow and put that weight up front and shoot the same mass. Gotcha. I'd rather shoot a 250 that's – you know, eight grains or nine grains per inch because they're really making some killer carbon nowadays that's lighter, yep. but stiff. Yep. And I'd still go to 625 grains. I'd just put a hell of a lot of stuff. I'd put a 200 grain point up front. Just hammered. And I would front. have a high, you know, have the four to center. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. Hmm. Well, that makes but sense. the bending uh, stuff. Let, is, me, let me interject. Yep. So it makes sense to do what Troy's talking about. Let's say I was just saying, oh, you can't be over spine, but you got to remember that you can't make a choice without considering all the other aspects of uh, the implications of that choice. So if you do choose a 200 spine arrow, you're putting weight all along the length of the arrow, a higher grains per inch. If you choose a 250 spine, uh, it's going to be a lighter grains per inch. You have the opportunity to put for the same total arrow weight, put more mass up front. And according to Dr. Ed, Dr. Ed Ashby's testing, which a lot of your uh, mm -hmm. are at least heard of or familiar with, his claim is that uh, I remember riding in a car with him one day and I asked him this question, what is the most profound thing that you learned from, from all of your testing? And he said that the effect of FOC, higher FOC on penetration was something I just couldn't, I couldn't believe. Hmm. And and in his paper, especially his 2008 study, uh, he talks about the FOC. Why does the FOC make a difference? Uh, and he and his point was that once the uh, uh, FOC means higher center, uh, forward, more forward center of gravity of your arrow, and that means your arrow is stiffer up front, and the amplitude of the bending is less, and so you have less uh, sidewall interaction with the bone. Mm -hmm. shaft and the bone and allows deeper penetration and that totally makes sense so if you understand that envelope of how we're working you can see that there's multiple pieces to be able to get there to improve your penetration once you or your chances of deeper penetration once you get to the target yeah so, that, that makes uh, sense i hope that i hope that makes sense right yeah Unless, if you shoot a super flexible arrow even if it hits straight in the animal it gets re-energized and it starts to bend and now that bending arrow has to interact with the bone that you just punched a hole through right or, rib or even the meat channel and you're going to slow down your pen you're going hmm. to uh, decrease your penetration just due to that fact yep. because you're under spine yeah so under spine is a, is a big problem right because it's, it's leading to all kinds of issues like you know too much bending in the air 
uh, loss of penetration on impact and also potential diversion of the arrow even inside the animal. But Right, and all three of those are negative yes. effects that can either compound or one of them could yep. be the big outlier. Right. We don't know which one, right? But you've added three components okay. to the mess. Yep. But, and so it makes sense to go heavier spined, you know, but, but eventually you hit a point where the weight, you know, is exceeding to a point where it's taking away from, you which know, would be the, the case FOC. with full metal jackets, Easton full metal jackets yeah. were kind of the ones where it was like, you had this, I, what were those like well, 13, you, 13 you probably GPI get a lot or something that too, but, but yeah. 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 In the sense that like yeah, a, lot, a lot of guys were at their maximum overall weight and it was just distributed over the course of the whole arrow. And it's right. like, well, it would make sense. Like the arrow setups that we've evolved to, you know, I've got a, a micro diameter carbon arrow that's mm -hmm. lesser grain grains per inch than that full metal jacket. But I've overall, it's the same way. Same way. It's just All stacked front. up front. It's the dart effect. Yeah, right. That's a great move. Yeah. I mean, that's the first the yeah. first time that yeah. somebody yeah. ever told me about FOC. We were in a bar and they had darts and they're like, well, go pick up a dart and and all the weights in the front. Right on that, or on a nerf, that nerf football is what I think. Of. Yeah, there you go, the like tail. the old room, yeah, mm -hmm. football. Yeah, so, football. yeah, right. so I mean, those those concepts kind of bring it to light. But I think the question, and I don't is I don't even know if there is a right answer. Is there a sweet spot percentage wise for FOC? Over over nineteen percent and then above. Really, it's the only one. It's the only factor this is why ed said what he said remember that study's 30 years 30 years long <laughs> it's not one guy dicking around for two months yeah and then getting on youtube and acting like me <laughs> right? i was gonna say that's called ranch 30 oh. years <laughs> right and um <laughs> it's the one factor he said it's the only factor that for every percentage a gain in forward to center, he saw additional penetration. Wow. It's the only one. That's why he said that because he, he, he built arrows that were 650 grains and they were super heavy, like a big, heavy wood birch arrow yep. that weighs 9 million pounds at 125 yep. grain point. And then he had carbon and he flipped it in a 650 grain arrow with 22% forward to center. Yep. And then he was shooting the great big buffaloes, right? Yeah. And I, I'd like to say something about that because we get the Ashby Foundation and Ed's study gets a lot of crap and people say, well, we aren't shooting buffaloes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Do you know why he shot the buffaloes? What's the advantage of shooting something gigantic? If it kills that thing, it'll kill a deer. <laughs> no, that's a great answer. And I'm not trying to be an ass hat. No, that's fine. Um, no. You can't measure penetration on a pass through. Mm. Mm -hmm. It tells you absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm. You need to catch the arrow. Mm -hmm. So you see all these, and I'll use an example that's modern day. You see all these, and they're about to come out. I just put up an Instagram reel about ballistic gel. Yep. Possibly the worst testing medium on the damn earth <laughs> for arrows. No, it is the worst. Really? Uh, Oh, it's a horrible test media. Yeah. Why? It's probably the worst thing on earth. To I shoot mean, because we've seen how many people, you know, I've seen them put uh, a deer scapula in it. I've seen it with plywood yep. or whatever, you is know. It, is, yep. it, is it inconsistency is why? No, it's super consistent. Okay. Which is not consistent <laughs> with what oh, a real animal nice. is. A deer, a deer is two inches of stuff, air and liquid for 14 inches, 12 and then another two yeah. inches of stuff. Oh, well, there's I, no correlation to, to penetration on animals. Yeah, None. but but it still is going to give you a very accurate result. Not just it's not necessarily translating to if it's going to kill a deer or not. But it that's is what consistent. they're saying. Though. I see. I see. That's what they're saying, right? I, so the the gel will do this mm -hmm. because it's consistent. I if you shoot it. a heavy arrow that's going slow. It'll catch it at the same rate as a as a light arrow going fast, and it looks like they all penetrate the same. Mm -hmm. it, they do in gel. Yeah, I get it. Hmm. Is, is there like in a? Gel, uh, that's the big problem. Uh, so it's it's kind of it's a marketing ploy, right? Because I mean, I've seen this time and well, time again. Look at the penetration of this arrow. No. Look at this and that. It, it's consistent. Well, look at it. Next time you watch one of those videos, look at it differently and ask yourself, how in the hell? Can they penetrate all within about an inch of themselves? Yeah. When you look at those pictures, yeah. like the thumbnails are always 
50 arrows in the gel block. And by the way, every arrow you shoot into the gel block and leave it, you've changed the gel. Exactly. Yeah, it's not consistent anymore. No, it's tighter. Yeah. So the next arrow is going to hit something even tighter, and the next arrow is even tighter. And if you pull them, you loosen it up. Well, you just so ruined they, a lot so of they, people's dreams and what they were reading I know, and I'm saying. I'm a dream smasher. <laughs> That makes sense. Mm. No, I'm not trying to be, I just, yeah. I'm not an 80% guy and I don't do bullshit. <laughs> and gel is bullshit. It's yeah. just a big bunch of BS. It's just not a good medium. It's a terrible, and listen, if they would say in ballistic gel, the results are X. Yep. Mm -hmm. That is not what they say. They say that one penetrated three quarters of an inch further. That'll be your best hunting point. Mm -hmm. Yep. Three quarters of an inch. Yep. No, I want it to go through them. I want sparks on the other side because it hit a rock so damn hard. It never slowed down. Yeah. And it's just very challenging on that front ha to do that stuff. Has but there... back to Ed, the, the animal was a replication of what you're shooting, which is a pretty solid armor as Barnett sure. likes to say, because the combination of skin, meat, and rib cage is actually armor. Yep. Mm -hmm. In between is basically not much resistance wise. Remember, it's heavily lubricated. The, the guts are all slimy, right? When you got them, it's not the greatest thing in the world to do. Mm -hmm. And they're not that, like when they're in your hand, when the organs are in your hands, they're not that resistant. No. I mean, just think about it, right? Yeah. Sure. Not, so you're not basically resistant. shooting. A good analogy would be, you know, OSB, yep. air, yep. and OSB. Yep. If you think about it like that, then it starts to make more sense um, how the gel tests don't replicate all the hunting videos. Mm-hmm. Because we see a wide and varied performance rate on animals on YouTube or whatever. Sure. But gel is super consistent. Mm -hmm. Unbel you don't ever see one just fly through it. No. Hmm. It's right. really crazy. Yeah. So, ha has there ever uh, been like a hundred percent? Yeah, so a couple of things, guys. Sorry, Daryl. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, don't go shoot OSB, airspace OSB. Well, shit, that was guys, my next question. Was it was like, is this a test we go and do? Like <laughs> yeah. No. Oh. Don't do it. The OSB is, is not a good uh, simulant of a bone in the first place because it, it doesn't expand the way the bone does. And so it, it holds tight to the arrow. And the gel holds tight to the arrow too. It's the friction between the arrow shaft and the, and the arrow that causes all of the penetration to be about the same. And uh, so the weight, the, the higher weight balance with the velocity really makes all of the penetration the same in the gel and the osb has its problems for for the fact that it doesn't shear out it doesn't break out around the, the arrow shaft but it tends to stay right at the diameter of the arrow shaft and it's hard to expand in that lateral direction so as osb is also not a good uh simulant so well my, you know, my example mean, was I mean, something hard right. and air and something hard so yeah osb was yeah, not the intent right. it's just something people right. put their hands on right. I got you. yeah i got you yeah right so do you guys, what do you think the, the density of the heart muscle is? Any idea? What is the density? I don't know. What's the metric of density? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know um, what a heart feels like. Per, it's dense. Mass per, mass per inch. Mass per inch? It's the density of water. So, uh, inches cubed. Masses per inches cubed. Okay. Mass over, mass over volume. Okay. And the density is the density of water. Hmm. If you go read the scientific textbooks about uh, it, uh, uh, thoracic, whatever the contents are, it's basically water. But it's even it's even for the arrow, it, it enables penetration even more than that because it's basically made up of blood, and blood is a, belongs to a category of uh, liquids that are called shear thinning fluids. If you apply a load to it and it shears across. Like if you ever stepped in a pool of blood, a lot of times you'll just slip right down. Right. And so I was wondering about that, kind of, that kind of I'm pretty familiar with that. <laughs> another example of sheer, a sheer thinning fluid is ketchup. 
right? Mm. You oh, sure. That, you know, you hit it quick and it shears out and you try to shake it a little bit, it's too thick. It's a shear thinning fluid under load. Okay, so um, sure anyway, the uh, the point is that it's hard to find man-made simulants. Uh, certainly, sure. gel is not going to model what's happening inside the animal. So save your save your readers or viewers uh, a lot of heartache. And don't recommend doing it. And for the viewers out there, the backyard doers, just don't shoot that stuff and try to claim that it sure. gives any indication of what's happening in an animal. It's not going to. Yeah, well, I mean, you need it. guys have wine. tested among like just carcasses, right? Like, yeah, I was gonna say a roadkill. Oh, yeah, or just even like a. I mean, not that everybody you can go out and afford one necessarily, but like a, a cow carcass or something, or a yeah, slab of beef. Yeah, I mean that's that's gonna be your that's that's the real thing. Yeah, the yeah, trouble with that is good. we might actually have the opportunity to test on Asian buffaloes here in Texas in a couple of months, but the trouble is it um, it's a lot of work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, it honestly is. We did a test the other day on a broadhead that Daryl and I were testing for a company. And I shot the pig in the head. I shot it in the pelvis. We shot it in the shoulder blade. <laughs> we bent the broadhead. We mm -hmm. bent the tip. It's a single bevel. It had some design flaws. And we basically destroyed the thing. Mm -hmm. mm. And it's just a lot of work that people don't want to do. And yeah. then they also don't have access to it. Yeah. When I came up with this idea to try to replicate Ed's study in the micro fashion on pigs, right? They're tiny, but in a live hunting situation and leverage an animal that the state doesn't recognize, no laws. Mm -hmm. That is a fact. Yeah. If y'all came down, you don't even need a hunting license. Just go after them. Because it's depredation hunting. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a in Texas, right? That's not all states. So... I said, well, that would be an awesome use of this resource because it's legal. I can put it up, right? And there's just not a lot of people who um, have that much access to them. And then I'm telling you, it's just a pain in the butt to do it. Sure. It's to do all the testing and shoot the thing and then drag it over and put it on a table and start writing down all the data yep. and try to figure out what you're doing. Shoot it four or five times. You really... 150 pound pig you probably shouldn't shoot more than about five times if you really want to be honest about your results mm -hmm. right you start to disable like if you break the shoulder if you break the scapula you're not being honest if you shoot it again no sure it's compromised it's compromised right yeah compromised. and it was pretty amazing on that one. That wasn't the biggest pig in the world. Even though we were having trouble with the broadhead itself, we had to stop the arrows. We shot it through the shoulder blade, through the spine, caused a four inch crack in the scapula at 20 yards. And it flew right through it. Hmm. Like it went through it, like it wasn't there. Intentionally trying to hit hard stuff. Yeah. So we're going to keep doing it. I've mm -hmm. got a I've got a big test coming up here. The hunting public's coming back down in June, and we're going to be doing some testing then <clears throat> on some new broadheads that are coming out. Hmm. That'll be super fun. What's been like the result of that? Like, obviously, it doesn't sound like it's a mystery. Like the things that produce better penetration, you know, whether it's 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 stiffer arrows, like the broadheads that you guys are using. Is there, you know, can we reach a point where it's like there's a hundred percent success, like? As far as far as past, if, if you know, if, if uh, success is uh, is determined is uh, forgive me described by a hundred percent pass through rate, do we have that? Yes, we have that on deer. Yeah. Okay. And and what is okay. it? What well, you know? What's the setup that does that? You're going to need a single bevel. You're going to need a machined broadhead that's either double bevel or preferably single bevel. Moderately long. Give us some brands. Who, 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 make, who makes those? Wide. Do what? Give us some brands. Who makes those? Uh, well, the Ranch Ferry head's coming out. That okay. thing will do it. You're um, making your own head? Yeah, I've got my own broadhead. My own 200 grain broadhead's coming out. It'll be out in about 10 days. All right. 29th of, 29th there's, of May. There's one. <laughs> but there's a lot of brands out there that are machined one piece, and they just... The shorter and blunter they get, so if you get down to 150 and 125, you start to 
you lose this kind of an angle yep. of attack and you start to get like that and get a little wide, mm -hmm. right? And then you really do need the momentum of 600. When it, it gets really, it really makes a difference. I mean, it really does. Is it because of the cutting surface? Like the, the amount of cutting surface that's hitting that you need that extra weight behind it? No, you want that. You want the penetrator to be efficient. Mm -hmm. So you, what you're taking is the shed, even though all this discussion we had about the jump rope and all that crap, even a 250 spine arrow, you're just reducing the frequency, right? Still it's happens. not a jump rope anymore. It's more like a guitar string. Yeah. That's an extreme example. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But people understand right. Right. those things. Right. And the reduced resistance you get from a longer, non-flexing, no screws, razor sharp, steel thing, it doesn't flex at all. That that head doesn't give. And it keeps going. And, and that long, tough head that everybody's scared to shoot. Yeah. Because it's it's way too manly for everybody to shoot the three hundred grain tough head. That some bitch is a beast. <laughs> and it looks so awesome on the end of an arrow. It looks like a spear. It's so cool, but it's too manly for most people. <laughs> that thing goes through stuff like it's not there. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It's almost silent when you shoot stuff. Mm -hmm. hmm. Like uh, you hear nothing. You shoot and you hear a tick and the arrow skip just, I mean, it's gone, but it's real long. Yeah. Yeah. So and super efficient on impact. So, Troy, Ranch Ferry Broadhead, uh, 600 grain total arrow weight is what you're saying. And then what kind of poundage are you shooting that with? It doesn't. You can do it with 55 pounds. Okay. The inertia really helps. It, it's hard to believe. I mean, it really is. We had a lady kill a Cape Buffalo with 55 pounds, 850 grain arrows. And she buried it to the fletching last year. Mm. Uh huh. On a bull. So, I mean, that, that so, feet per second that, that is coming out. I mean, because that's what we're talking about, right? 55 versus 70 speed, it's mm -hmm. leaving the bow. The, the weight of the arrow in that head, obviously, the, the shape and weight of that head has way more to do with what happens once it hits the animal than the speed it's leaving the bow. Yeah. Yeah. Daryl, you want to chime in here just a little bit on the stratagem here? <laughs> Well, Strategy. yeah, so there's, there's one thing that comes to mind. There, there's two things that come to mind. Uh, the first one is uh, in the uh, armor community, one of the things that we learn is that the resistance of the target is proportional to the velocity that you impact with. Okay. So if, you, if you're shooting really fast, it's like the difference of like taking your hand like this and pushing it through water. Yep. Versus or taking your hand like this and slapping the yep. surface of the water. Yep. Right. Yep. And yeah, it's an easy thing, easy thing to kind of see, and it's true on arrows impacting through. It, the uh, velocity is not necessarily bad, right? Because the arrow gets there faster, the trajectory is flatter, all of these kinds of things, which are can be important. <clears throat> but as far as the penetration, you want the resistance penetration to go down. And, and so that are, are to be low, you want the broadhead to be efficient. And when you do that, you find that the, the, the bow poundage is not the major driver. You gotta have adequate, but going up more just means that you've penetrated the animal, you know, you pass through the animal and the arrow keeps on going. Hmm. How about how about this speed on the other side of the animal? How about shooting distance on that, Daryl? I mean, obviously, having a little bit oomph, more oomph coming out of the bow, reach out and touch them a little bit further? Yeah, no doubt. There's no doubt. I mean, it's a, it's a trade-off just like everything else is. Heavier spine, it's a trade-off. Everything's a trade-off. Everything's a compromise. Um, what, I would, what I would say there is what Dr. S says, shoot the, shoot the heaviest arrow that you are comfortable with the trajectory. That, you know... Um, Hang on, let me look it up. I'll answer it for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, we did a and, study uh, and we shot, oh, hang on. We shot an arrow set at 60 yards. Okay. And we measured it with a lab radar and we did the momentum and the kinetic energy downrange. Yep. 
And if I can find my pictures, we'll be good here. The it was it was kind of it was quite disturbing. Um, and I was very surprised by the results. And I don't think I'm going to be able to find it. That's awesome. <laughs> Hang on. Well, anyway, well, we shot 400 that. and we shot 388, 410. Right. And all the way up to 715 grains. Okay. Out to 60. Okay. Through the lab radar. And the... Daryl, if I was, if I remember correctly, and I'll probably find it here in a minute, the momentum at 60 of a 515 grain arrow was higher. No, the momentum, what was it, Daryl, on the 550 grain the, arrow? The momentum of a it. 525 grain arrow mm -hmm. at, the, hit, at the, the momentum 60. of the 525 at 60 yards was greater than the uh, 388 grain arrow at launch. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. At the bow. Yep. At launch. Hmm. At the bow. So you can imagine how much momentum the, the 388 grain arrow lost as it was flying down. As it was flying yards. down. But the 520, yeah, but the 525, because it, it uh, uh, had higher mass, even though it started with lower velocity, maintained its momentum uh, downrange out at 60 yards. And so okay, I that's found it. it. That just kind of... I found one of them. Okay. So, All right, so this uh, is kinetic energy. Um, my bow, 65 pounds at 20 and a half inches. Okay. The launch KE for a 388 grain arrow was 70 foot pounds. Okay. At 60 yards, it was 56 foot pounds. Wow. For a 514 grain arrow, the launch KE was one pound more. It was 71 foot pounds. Mm hmm. And the impact KE went up five foot pounds hmm. to 61. Remember, well, that's 10%. Yeah. And it doesn't sound like much, but we're only shooting 70. Yeah. And this is where I think it gets lost. Most of the, most of us have come out of a firearms background in some capacity where you're running 2,500 foot yep. pounds of kinetic energy. I mean, you're, it's overwhelming amounts of, of yeah. Of power, right? We're launching at 71. Yeah. To gain five more foot pounds at 60 yards is worth it. Yeah, substantial. Mm -hmm. It's substantial because it's such a slow, mm -hmm. low energy projectile. Mm -hmm. hmm. And the 718 grain arrow, which I will admit is quite impractical to shoot 60 yards, it can be done. It's just, it's lopy. It lost at 73 foot pounds and it hit at 64 foot pounds. Wow. At 60 yards. Remember the 388 grain arrow, the, the arrow most people would choose to shoot far, launched at 70 and hit at 56. Mm. And the 718 grain arrow had 64 foot pounds at 60 yards. And I would, so, ass I would assume those heavier ar arrows, Troy, were heavier up front foc built heavier not just like balanced they were all yep. that was the, that's the easiest way to get there stack it up so it, fair it's totally yep. fair right well but, but i and i say that because you know i think we anybody who's shot like i mean i don't know let's see uh, so probably in the early 2000s right it was you know go to the dick sporting goods bin and pull whatever carbon arrows yeah, you know sure. th they had right super super light super super fast right i mean that because that was the carbon thing it was the maxima 350 yeah, right. maxima 350 type and your yeah absolutely yeah. and so and i say that because you know i think that a lot of us you know we're shooting 30 we were confident 30 and in but we all went we stepped back to 40 to 50 to 60 of and course. and that yes there's definitely user error in that because of the part but also that arrow was a mess flying through the air to mm -hmm. the target right and yep. so right. you know it, it, i think because of how many different things were going on with that faster lighter arrow coming out of that bow sure there's user error in it but it's also that arrow wasn't going to perform well 
at that that kind of a distance because of how much shit was going wrong you, with you it. You do still see it too. Like there's TV guys that you'll see like their arrow that they're shooting out there 40, 50 yards and it just. Yeah, well, it's in the. Oh, it's wobbling like crazy. And, and, and yeah, it like smacks them sideways. Anything, so. Yeah, it's in the yeah. target wrong. You go, they walk up to the target and it's like, wait a minute, it looks like chopsticks crossing over everything. You're like, what the hell's yeah. going on here? You know? <laughs> and immediately people say, right. oh, you right. know, maybe my, my rest is off, right? Maybe, you know, I need to adjust my rest or it's not dropping cleanly or it's to the left or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's not necessarily the case. No, it's, I think the, you know, one of the most, going back to y'all's original comments, if I was getting a new bow and starting over, I would really spend a lot of time with the arrow group that I have, mm-hmm. whether that's six or 18. And I would shoot a ton of reps, making sure they bear shaft pretty darn close. And I say this all the time. If you can get them at seven yards to bear shaft within about half an inch, seven remember yards. you're hanging on to the bow and you're not that good. Just get the hell over yourself. Yeah. Right. Okay, you're not a you machine. Mean, you you're not a hooter stuff, shooter. A half inch right? tear. So, yeah, just a half inch tear or less. Yeah. I get a lot of emails from people okay. who are really freaking out, and they want bullet holes out of every shaft. And I don't know how many times they've shot when they send me a picture of their tears. Yeah. They could have ran a hundred arrows that day. Yeah. Right. That's just tired. And, and, yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say. Well, is it in, in with that, Troy? Um, is that mm-hmm manufacturing variation user error like if they can't shoot bullet holes is it just because you know listen like that's just the variation you're going to see in these arrows that you're shooting out of this combination so there's a combination of things there there's some there are some bow platforms out there that are absolutely hateful grandmothers Hmm. there are some bow platforms that are super popular especially the short stuff Short axle to the axle cool stuff. Thing all day or now short is brace. Shoot a 29 inch bow. Yeah. You're gotcha. an idiot if you're shooting a bow that short. Gotcha. And I'll tell you why you're an idiot. There's not a guy in AT in, in five spot or 3D shooting a 29 inch bow. No, there isn't. Mm-hmm. Why are they not shooting a 29 inch bow? Yeah, if you're asking because us, they are not accurate. Yeah, it's because they're easier to pack and they're easier to hunt with in a tree stand. Well, that's the that's marketing. Why. That's the marketing spin, right? It's it's that's your hunt bow. It's your hunt bow. Yeah, what's well, reality the guys too? I mean, shooting for money in Vegas are not shooting. No, they're shooting forty a plus. Twenty nine inch bow. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Thirty fours, thirty six, forties. Yeah. Yep. They're yeah. more stable. Hmm. Sure. The bow's more stable. Okay. I get a kick out of it because you're like you're deer hunting. Wouldn't you want the most accurate platform, even if it's 36 inches tall, that you can shoot? No. Wouldn't you? <laughs> no. We want to kind of have a half-ass one, but we're cool, and our arrow is longer than the boat. Well, you want to have something realistic, too. What a, what right? a, <laughs> well, what about, um, what about cam size? Because that's one thing that I've kind of shook my head out a little bit is, like, some of these bows, I mean, they, their cams are as big as my head. I don't know that much about that. So what has been your, what has been your, I, I mean, I, I guess it, it comes around like, um, some of these shorter axle to axle bows that have larger cams for speed. Um, you, mm-hmm. you get into the cam lean aspect of things, right? And, oh yeah. And there's no doubt about that, man. And then it starts getting wonky cause it's launching different. That's what I'm saying. You know, uh, there's plenty of high end brands yeah. out there. I mean, cams are literally as big as your head you know number one i don't want to walk around the woods and risk banging that thing you know against something number two is like you know you that cam lean aspect of things is is for sure happening and those i mean that is you're pulling well, 70 pounds on that up. yeah exactly man the strings at a real severe angle yeah right it starts to pinch up like that it starts yeah. to get real 30 to 31 I had one inch. Of the company send me mm-hmm. i had a 31 inch boat that shot great and I had them send me one that was 34 inches long. Yep. It is like shoot. It will shoot damn near anything. It is so pleasurable to shoot. It just doesn't bitch at you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's fast. It's 65 pounds. It's plenty fast. Remember, I don't care about that. But it's not slow like some of the single cams used to be in the old days. Sure. And stuff. It's a fast, fastish bow. It's not lightning fast, but it's fast. Hmm. Nice and smooth. Yep. It's comfortable to shoot. And when you draw the bow, it doesn't have a big hump in it. Yep. Which you is know? huge. Yeah. And again, it just goes yeah. bonk and it feels stable. Yep. 
Yeah, dead but in the every hand. time I go to a 3D shoot, which is about twice a year, it just bores me to death. And it's during it's <laughs> during the best time of fishing at the coast, so I'm not thinking about shooting the bow. But uh, yeah. um, I'm amazed how long the bows are. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, they're huge. And then I think to myself, wait, these are guys who are tuning that thing up to shoot a circle that big. Yep. That's the, that's in the guts. I might add terrible practice mm -hmm. but they want to be super accurate and that same guy will shoot a 29 inch absolutely finicky will. ass grip sensitive piece of crap when he's hunting for a deer yeah yeah does that make any sense not besides the marketing ploy that they're, they're <laughs> going into yeah it's... I, I, you don't have to be nice to me does that make any sense no. Well, <laughs> well, there's definitely there's advantages to like you know the smaller your weapon, you know it's obviously it's less to deal with. I can put it on my back. I can if I'm on a bike, if I'm in a tree stand, if I'm in a blind. There's advantages to having a smaller weapon, just it, period, right? Mm -hmm. You know, even if you took took it down further to say like I have a crossbow, it's super it's super compact, right? It's I can easily right. put them. I can, you know, so it's it's uh, there's some practicality considerations I think when it comes to to the smaller bows and yes it yeah definitely... we can just agree to disagree because I think that damn accuracy beats all of it I just don't well I don't think, I, I think don't disagree with you that you would figure it out I don't disagree yeah. with that I mean yeah accuracy does yeah. does supersede all but that that's the reason I, in addition to the market well stuff. yeah I mean because it's all it, and that goes back to the cam side as well I mean everything here's here's the thing there, there are a lot of great bows out there on the market right now from a lot of different manufacturers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, in terms of the technology out there, I would say there's not a ton of variation between a lot of those manufacturers. Yeah, um, that's right. But so what, what ends up happening is this, and it's, I don't think it's necessarily engineers. I think it's the marketing departments who are driving these quote innovations that i don't think are making the bows any better in most cases i think they're making bows worse um case in point some of those ones that you know out of nowhere you know start you know trying to hit you know 350 360 ibo uh you know mm -hmm. cams is the size of your head and it's like what you know why like your last bow was was great like it, it shot great people loved it you know what why come out with this whole new platform design like out, like it comes out of nowhere, you know. Um, I, I think that the I don't know this for a fact, Daryl. Does this make any sense from an engineering perspective? If you had a, a short bow that was real pinched up, right? So when you draw it, because it's short, yeah, you know, it's going to be Tight. the string angle is going to be like that. Yeah. Would big wheels roll the string further back from the limb and increase that angle? Does that make any sense? Maybe they do it for that. I know they're making yeah, it fast. They would. But yeah, they, that would that would help actually. That would help. Help with the so, pinch. Okay. I'm not sure it'd help a whole lot. Right, but yeah. I'm just thinking if the wheel's real big, right? Yeah. Then when it rolls over, the string's gonna start and limbs here. Yeah. The string's gonna start out here and, and it's gonna yep. take that angle out. Yep. So yep. yeah. I know they're trying That's to go right. fast with the round wheels, the big wheels, but maybe they're trying to uh, do two things at once with those giant wheels. I mean, right? there there are, and I mean, they're not what I would consider like the premium bow companies out there, but there are some of these smaller bow companies that literally are making like 20, 20 inch axle to axle type bows, like 22, 24 inch. It's like, what? what well, that's are, a barrel shooting. <laughs> yeah. Right? You shoot one of those little China bows. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to say anything. <laughs> Sling <laughs> it. <laughs> Slinging, 20, slinging darts. 20 ATA bow that I'm shooting in the backyard right now. You do not. 20 inches. That's funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What is your, what's your thought on <laughs> it? Well, what do I have to compare leave, it to? Leave him alone. Don't, don't tell him anything. Holy don't cow. You could at least give him something better than a slingshot, Troy. I mean, holy hell. No wonder he's like he's like I don't know about this bow stuff, Troy. I'm kind of all over the place. He's got a 20 inch axle to axle bow. I'm trying, man. That's right. Oh, Listen, good. I'm having fun. I don't I don't have any anything to compare it to, and you know as far as I know, I pull it back and the arrows go zing, <laughs> and that's all I care about right now. We've we've you had know? a couple of manufacturers that to supply to supply him a bow, right? Yeah. Well, guess what? He's left-handed. Ah, uh, mm-hmm. 
And we, I had one bow around here we can make left-handed. So we made it left-handed just to get him shooting. And we'll see what happens with that. But, <laughs> well, Daryl, I mean, it's, um, this is this is kind of an interesting take for me because I love it. hearing your, um, it, you know, this time and in last time at ATA, I mean, your knowledge on on aero flight and, and the mechanics of all this, uh, you know, book wise is off the charts, right? Now you're stepping into the live action experiment yourself. Correct. I mean, I guess how That's much right. of how much of kind of what you theorized now when you're shooting, you're like, oh shit, that's not not as easy as I thought that was going to be. <laughs> well, if you so let me uh, let me dance a little bit on that because I never did uh, uh, recommend any particular type of bow. Everything right. that I've ever talked about is what happens to the arrow when it comes off the bow. Correct. Right. After it comes off the launcher, uh, arrow flight is an initial value problem. What does that mean? That means that that uh, everything that happens in flight or 99% of that arrow flight happened at the bow. So if you did something crazy at the bow, it's going to control how that arrow flies when it gets down range. You kicked it off, you torqued it off, or it bent because it was underspined or or whatever all gets exacerbated as it as it flies down range and the errors increase and now the perspective is and, and i love this perspective actually i love being here at this stage of not knowing you know what photo shoot or what equipment is the better equipment and all this kind of stuff because i see what the effects are and i'm learning what the effects are on what's actually happening down at the target and understanding arrow flight and all of that uh, leads me back to like you know trying to trying to figure out what are the major error sources when you launch this thing from a bow right and i'm sure my 20 inch ata bow is not the best bow in the world but like I said, I don't have anything to compare it to, and I pull it back, launch it, and it shoots great. You know, it hits that big block 20 yards downrange, and and as far as I can tell, it, uh, uh, you know, it did it kind of where the pin was when I let the darn thing go. But what I what I understand, <laughs> what I understand from that is that helps me to be able to convey the knowledge that I have to the average bow hunter mm -hmm. because I'm experiencing the same thing that the average bow hunter are even more people much more knowledgeable than me as far as shooting what they experienced as they were going through this and it, it just helps me communicate better and that's why I I don't mind shooting that bow at all because it makes me a better engineer it makes me a better uh, advocate for absolutely what trying, to do is trying to teach people to be better hunters right yeah, so I just feel like I have a better foundation mm -hmm. from doing it. I think that's huge, man. I mean, there's you know no yeah, knock to the engine, the engineers out there, right? But I'm I'm sure there's a lot of great engineers out there developing products that, in theory, are great, but practically they don't use them, right? It's the, whatever. It's not something that they're passionate about, or they. And so it it always is kind of the question of like, well. You can be a great engineer and make a great product, but you know, if you were the end user, I'm sure you can continue to figure out ways to improve it, to make it better. Right. Yeah, that's, that that's goes right. along with that broadhead I told you we broke. Yep. When we got it, it looked, oh, it was sexy. Yeah. It did what, we, it did what the manufacturer wanted. It had a couple, has a couple of tweaks that are really cool for the market and it's single bevel, it's machined as one piece. We sent it with a friend of ours to Argentina. And he said, where do you want me to shoot the buffalo once it's down? And I said, shoot it right. And me and Daryl both said, shoot it right in the shoulder blade. Mm -hmm. And he sent back two pictures like that of them bent over mm -hmm. and said, uh, go back to the drawing board, tell them, you know, tell the manufacturer to get their shit together. And like, <laughs> okay. And, and then we got another version. Yeah. And it was better, yeah. But it chattered. Mm. The blades chattered. Mm -hmm. And then we got another version, and the tip was still a little soft. So we put a better tip on it, and now it's you know that's four versions later. 
Yeah, but I mean and that's that's how it should be, right? And and that's maybe, not how it's done, though. I know. Most well, that's what I was going to say. Broadheads out there and call it right. good. And it, it's not even just in the broadhead side. It's in so much of this in in the hunting industry in general that it's just you know what's the next tweak on the grunt call we can make, and and it's not innovation, right? It's not improving the the efficiency for so many people out there. It's just let's just make another thing that we can sell. And that's, that's what a lot of things have been in this industry for quite a long time. And so when you get true innovation or true craftsmanship behind something, I mean, I think a lot of people appreciate it or they at least should. Well, that's why we, that's the tweaks we made on the, on the ranch bear head is I wanted something a little longer than the previous version. We have a slot in it so you can put bleeder blades in it Mm -hmm. or, or not. It doesn't matter. You can the bleeder blades are fifteen grains. You can put them in there and yep. screw them down, or you can not shoot bleeder blades. Doesn't matter, right? But the first Instagram post I put up about it, I got accused of copying a couple other brands. Well, guess what? It's a machined one piece single bevel broadhead. Tires are round. Screwdrivers look about the same, <laughs> yeah. and then ball caps you're wearing aren't yeah. that cool. So yeah. you boys need to get the hell over that. Right? <laughs> it's kind of microphones. Those, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All that stuff, it's, there's, there's, there's functional similarities. Yes. And then you say, okay, so what do we do next? What's the next thing? Yeah. Well, I wanted the broadhead to go from here to more like that. Yep. I wanted a bleeder blade option. If you want to shoot bleeder blades, fine. And we're only offering it in 200 grains because I want it like that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to lose money because I'm not willing to sell a 150 or 125. That's what I was going to say. Cause yeah, because I believe I know for a fact about the angle of attack and the longer you can make them, they're just more efficient. Is there any, dis- bees, Oh, shark teeth, bee stingers, yeah. stingray stickers, yep. cactus thorns, all the stuff in nature long, is more sharp, long yep. penetrators. Right. And I promise you rattlesnake teeth are special. Yeah. Or rattlesnake fangs. Yeah. So um, that's why we did that. And to your point, I'd like to see innovations when people do stuff, not just to say, oh, we made a new weight. Or, well, why? Like yeah. this company we were working with, we broke the damn thing three times. Yeah. That thing's going to be nails when it comes out. Right. And hmm. it's just... You know what it is? It just costs money and it I and people don't have access to do it. I'm yeah. I'm really fortunate that we do have this population of stupid animals. Daryl shot one with his rifle just to get us one. I mean, we needed a test pig, man. Yep. <laughs> we weren't hunting. Just shoot we one. A piece of meat on the ground. Yep. Right? So Daryl went out there and blasted one with his three oh eight, calmed one down, as I like to say. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And uh <laughs> so then we could do the test. So it's just really hard. Yeah. To do the to do it right. When when you talk about uh your your broadhead being two hundred grains, is there an advantage to just having, you know, the full weight up front in a solid one piece broadhead versus, you know, like Jared and I are, are using outsert systems and things like that to add weight? Any advantages? I really disadvantages? appreciate this question because I'm getting ready to go on a little bit of a rampage on this. Okay, hit us. Um, just not y'all, but in general, um, I've shot 300 grain broadheads with 15 grains of aluminum inserts a lot, mm-hmm. and I've had no problems bouncing off the ground. I hit a feeder leg and it bounced straight back after mm-hmm. it went through a pig, a, a piece of two inch angle, mm-hmm. and the broadhead bounced, uh, the arrow bounced straight back, didn't bend. I think that the insert thing is a, is a straw man. Interesting. I really am starting to believe is a straw man because when you, I have a lot of people write me, I get a thousand messages a month in May, June, July, August, and September from people tuning arrows and broad day questions and all this stuff. It's just nonstop. It's really great. It's how I'm wired and I don't mind answering the questions, but I get a lot of people who say, Hey man, I shot one of your kits. Or I tested some 250s and, a, and I got a 100 grain insert and 150 grain point work. That's 300 grains. So what I'm thinking about doing is shooting a 150 grain insert and a 125 grain point or 150 grain point. 
And I'm like, well, why wouldn't you shoot a 200 grain broadhead and reduce your insert mass and go to something that has more steel, Mm -hmm. more likely to be made of steel, Mm -hmm. less likely to have screws and bolts, less likely to have parts that come apart or can be reassembled. And quite frankly, better steel, better metal, less likely to dull. That's a total physiology discussion. We can do that on another podcast, but sharp and sharp that can handle impact are two different things. If it flies through the first three inches of penetration and dulls 50%, your success rate's going down 50%. I've had people tell me, I had a guy who has a broadhead company. He thinks he's a damn genius about every topic on the earth. And he he told me, as long as it gets in there, it'll kill him. <laughs> that sounds like one. <laughs> and I'm like, absolute. that is an absolute fallacy. You can live a long time with a piece of rebar through your chest. If you ever get a piece of rebar through your chest, by the way, go to the ER with the rebar in you. Yeah, yeah. Don't pull it out. Mm-mm. You're going to die. You'll bleed out. You'll be better off with it in you. Yeah. And But if it doesn't cut the internal organs, but it's if it's moving through that substrate, moving it around, but it doesn't cut everything, your efficiency is reduced. That's a physiologic fact. There's no way around that. And arteries are semi-muscular. They're much more like a rubber band than they are a piece of a wet fettuccine. Okay. And they'll ride right over. I've, I've actually tried to do needle sticks back when I was practicing on it right here. There's an artery that you stick for a blood gas. It comes right out of your heart. And so you can actually get pure gas read. It's red blood, not the blue stuff. Right. And I've had to go, I go like this and you see the artery sitting there and it just goes, nah, psych. Yeah. It rolls. It's in between two tendons right here. And it still rolls out of the way of a needle. And you've got somebody sitting still and stuff. Well, yeah. moderately still. Some people jump around a little bit, but Squirrely. right. If your broadhead's kind of dull. So back to what I was pointing out is a little longer blades super sharp and then steel quality that goes up that can handle that first initial touch to not be compromised broadheads do two things they stay sharp or they get they dull they don't get sharper at impact Mm -hmm. so that's why i would say reduce your insert mass yep raise your broadhead mass yep and find something that's got thicker blades and et cetera, et cetera. That makes sense. For killing stuff. Yep, yep. Hmm. I didn't quite put Even them, if it's 150 or whatever. I didn't yeah. quite put them together completely where, so, you know, if we're talking about the the outsert system, I get sharper. I get that. Heavier, what, stronger. What is the disadvantage to using, you know, if they're the same sharpness and the same length, you know, on the broadhead, what's the disadvantage of using a, a lesser weight broadhead with an outsert system? As opposed to just because a heavier. traditionally the broadheads to reduce mass, they thin the blades, they use aluminum, they have to use lighter materials. Okay. There's they more tend to be in pieces like modular, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And they tend to shorten up. I said this earlier, I'm not going to offer in my broadhead is you're going to have 200 grains with a good angle of attack. Mm-hmm. I could sell a lot more broadheads at 125 and 150. Sure. But they get short. The blades get shorter. Yep. The cutting surface reduces and they get more like this. And they're just not effective penetrator. Again, thorns and fangs and stingray stickers and sharp teeth and all that stuff. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I got you. Are, are there like so, sp- specific metals, Troy, that you should be looking or like you would have alternatives? You're like, if I wanted to do a hundred grain broadhead and have the same angle of attack and all of that, you know, could you use a different metal? I don't think you can get there with the current steels available. Barnett and I talk about this all the time. We're trying to design a three to one Ashby style broadhead. That's 125 grains. We may have to make an experimental one. That's not really a hunting head, just something we can shoot and test against. Yeah. And what we want to do is take that, what we call the Ed head, which is the three to one big man, boy, tough head 
and have different weights of those so we can shoot a 450 grain arrow but it has that long point yeah and test it just say at 450 if that's the deal if that broadhead's that efficient does that can we get away with it at 450 because we're still asking asking those questions the current set of data says four to center over 19 percent perfect arrow flight super sharp 650 grains and you that is the gold standard top penetrator right now mm -hmm. and ed ashby will tell you that he'll say right now and then he'll hand you his four pages of questions that he still <laughs> wants to know he killed two rhinoceroses with a bow if there's a dude in the bow hunting world who should say screw all you idiots burn in hell you don't know what you're talking about it should be him honestly he killed two rhinos <laughs> that's crazy he is that humble he's one of the best people you'll ever meet hmm. i love that guy i asked him i said the first one of the first times i met him that was awesome i drove up in my truck i don't know what i'm getting into i opened the door he's sitting on his porch he pulls out a pistol and he says, are you a salesman? And I said, no, he goes, I was shot the last one. And he shoots his target like four times in front of him. It was freaking awesome. <laughs> right. The first question after we got all the butt sniffing go done is I said, is there a velocity based arrow platform because the compounds go faster? that's less than 650 grains. This is the most profound answer I've ever heard. I don't know. Hmm. That's what Ed said. Now, how many of the pro bow hunter guys would say, I don't know? Yeah. Zero. Hmm. But that dude who shot two rhinos and a million other things and was a PH and all that stuff, he literally said, I don't know. We need to test it. Yeah. I think that's freaking beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Really. It, it's, it's one of the best answers I've ever heard in my life. Hmm. And it sets the tone for what me and Daryl are doing. Yeah. I'll never forget that day. Cause I, you'd figure he'd say, oh, it's all bullshit. Doesn't matter. Yeah. I right. Proved it already. Ain't 30 years enough. But he literally has four pages of questions he wants us to answer. That's he fell off a mountain and hurt himself, so the study stopped. Hmm. Yep. Wow. So here we are. Crazy, the man. The science dorks. Well, I mean, yeah. I think you guys are doing it right. I mean, you know, it, it's a ton of information for, you know, the especially the average bow hunter to really consume yeah. and do. And, and you know. Transparently, most people won't do it. They'll do the same thing they've been doing and buy the same thing they have and, you know, whatever's on the shelf or whatever the marketing tells them to do. But, you know, there's a group of people out there that, you know, are thoroughly interested in making sure that their setup is, you know, the most lethal setup that they can they can operate with. Um, you know, and I think that that's kind of where a lot of these people listening to this are going to say, you know, let me reevaluate what I'm doing right now. And per what we heard here and per the resources that you guys have, um, you know, what can I do to maybe improve it? And maybe it's not all in one magical leap, right? But, but they start baby stepping that way. Well, that's why I, I support, like, my, Magnus is one of my sponsors. He doesn't make any big old heavy one pump heads. Yep. Right? Yep. He makes the Stinger at 125. He makes 100 grain broad heads. I think he still carries 85s. I'm not sure. Yep. But he, they're screwed together. Yep. You can replace the blades, but he's a super good dude and it's a baby step head. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to go from a three blade punch point this year. That's 125 grain to a cut on contact stinger. Mm -hmm. I, if, if, if I can just get people to do that and keep walking up the hill and go play, I've done my job. Nobody's going to go from 400 to 700 grains in a leap. I got it. I didn't do it. I, I went from 350s to 300s and thought I was crazy on spine. I dared to put 100 grains in the front, thought that was crazy. The arrows looked like they were walking down, like I could outrun them. 
And then I started shooting stuff and absolutely I'm talking blowing through stuff like they weren't there and said something changed. Yeah. Hmm. That's and that's crazy. been the whole, and one other thing I wanted to touch on, we need to obviously let you guys go because it's been a long time, but feral hogs are an interesting target in that, in the fact that they're, their rib spacing is very narrow compared to a deer. They have the big boys have shields on and the shields aren't that hard to penetrate. They're way overblown as far as arrows are concerned. The rib cage is very close together. So that usually is what sucks up the arrow uh, at impact. But they probably have one of the smallest kill zones of anything on the planet or earth hmm. that I, I've ever gutted. A 200 pound feral hog's lungs are as big as your hands spread wide open. That's the target area. Damn. You don't have a choice. Yeah. But to shoot them in the shoulder. Yeah. There's nothing behind the crease. Guts. <laughs> wow. And so back to the long bow conversation and trying to be more accurate. As I've actually learned over the last seven years where the damn kill zone is on them things, because it's stupid forward and stupid low. Everybody thinks I'm just talking out my butt. Oh, it's low and forward. Rah, rah, rah. No, it's that's where it's at. That's it's just it is. Mm -hmm. I've really, really seen how maximizing broadhead quality for cutting because they're muddy and stuff. They eat up broadheads and the most accurate bow and arrow platform you can get going back to the longer bows really contributes to your overall lethality. Yeah. It's because the kill zone's so small. I, yeah. I have people bring me a video back all the time and I smoked them and I look at it and I go, nah, we'll see that one tomorrow. They're three inches behind the crease. Mm -hmm. Damn thing's not even going to die. Jeez. They just laugh. They're like, they go show their friends. Hey man, look at that. Yeah. Idiot. No go. <laughs> They're pretty crazy. So that's it's wild. Been man. A, it's, it, it's really fun. So right now, um, as you guys are continuing to, to do stuff, still uh, Ranch Ferry Channel, is that still the main place for everybody to find stuff? Yeah, find me and Daryl on the Ranch Ferry Channel and then on Instagram under Ranch Ferry. And I think I'm on Facebook still, but eh. yeah, I got up to 5,000 people or whatever and you had to change your account and I don't give a hell. I don't give a damn. So I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, you'll be fine. And, and where can people get I'm your broadhead, Troy? Yeah. On your website? But you can just type in Ranch Ferry Store Got on it. Google. It's a serious archery. They're my arrow sponsor, my broadhead sponsor, and all that stuff. Okay. But it'll be out in – we've got the 200-grain three-blade, and we've got the 200-grain single bevel coming at, back out. The three-blade was out last year, but the, the single bevel will come out May 29th. Come and out. probably be sold out by September 1st. We're usually done by then. Uh, coincidentally, if I'm uh, looking at our schedule correct, people are listening to this on May 30th, so it is officially out. Oh, okay. Shazam, it's out. <laughs> it's out. It's Serious out there. Serious Archery Ranch Ferry. There you go. You can and... just Google Ranch Ferry Store. I have the dumbest name in archery, so it's easy to not forget. <laughs> the Googler finds me real quick. There you go. So, yeah, it's out. It's available. Check it out. Yeah. Woo! There you go. Right on. Cool, guys. Well, listen, as always, appreciate you coming on and dropping some knowledge on us. Jared and I are just continually trying to sponge this stuff up. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people listening to this are going to be in a similar position in that, you know, they they come from a background of, of purely, you know, hunting and what they saw on TV or what so-and-so was using. And, you know, that's what they've kind of married themselves to. But, you know, I think with the amount of information you guys are putting out there, there's a, a big opportunity for people to to get out there and find more things that are going to work in their favor. The only thing me and Daryl are trying to do is make you more lethal. Which should be the point at the end of the day anyways. No, I mean, I, I'll yeah, finish right. with this. 90% of what you read and hear on YouTube and watch on, on bow tuning and arrows and stuff is flying the thing to the target. They're not studying penetration. This is why Ed gets all the crap on the message boards and all that stuff. He studied one thing. What penetrator 
will go through them stupid buffaloes more consistently at more angles than anything else. That's all he's studying. He didn't worry about the velocity and all that stuff. Yeah. He just studied penetration. Hmm. So I get a lot of crap from different people about because their mindset is flying it there. Right. I'll give you a good example in the ballistics thing, and then I'll we'll shut off because this is going to piss off some people who bought a 6.5 Creedmoor. <laughs> <laughs> I damn well, I'll shoot right next to you with a 300 Win Mag all day long as far as you want to go, brother. I promise you, I can shoot them kind of in the middle with a 300 Win Mag and some bitches are going down. <laughs> you better be real accurate with that 6.5. Oh, yeah. You better hit them just right. Yeah. I hope your boys own the 6.5. I, I do. <laughs> I do for long range for long range target shooting. I don't I don't oh, hunt. Right. Yeah, I don't hunt. Good for shooting jackrabbits and stuff. Yeah, I don't hunt with it. I don't hunt deer with it. I shoot long range with no, it. I think it's just the elk guys that are shooting them, shooting elk with them. I've you know, heard a lot of a lot of people, you know, through and through on some of those things and that's about oh, it. Yeah. yeah. Give me a three thirty eight Lapua, baby. We'll yeah. we'll just we'll go rocking and rolling together. It'll be great. That's uh, the way to <laughs> crazy, man. Well, we appreciate it, boys, as always. And, uh, yeah, everybody listening, check out the uh, Ranch Ferry Head, available now. All right. Thanks, guys. Y'all have a good one. Thanks, right, boys. Guys. Appreciate right. it. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Yes, sir. Yeah. Appreciate it, Daryl. chat with you guys. The Hunter Podcast is brought to you by Stealth Cam. Dude, where would we be without our cell cams? I would definitely be divorced at this point. <laughs> yeah, I hear that. I mean, the fact is, is I spent more time checking cameras than I actually did hunting prior to cell cameras. Now, at least, my wife can enjoy me being in the comfort of my own home, buried in my phone, checking those pictures. Yeah, 100%. And, dude, when it comes to uh, trail cameras and definitely cell cameras, reliability is, I think, the number one thing that we're looking for. Stealth Cam just has a long reputation of reliable cameras, and ultimately, that is the most important thing to us. They have to work. In terms of reliability, there's not a better camera on the market than Stealth Cam, whether you're talking about the Fusion X, the Reactor, or the DS4K Transmit. And most of them are under 200 bucks. SouthCam.com. Check them out. Perfect. Ooh, a lot of info. Always good to have Troy and Daryl it, on there. Dude, it's so hard to try to consider like every single, every element of like, it is such a complicated thing when you yeah. consider like, like from the bow and everything we talked about the bow, the length, you know, the, the pinching of the arrow with your string, like the t torque and the human element to uh, to what's happening with the arrow in the yeah in the air to like actually at impact. It's like there's so many things that could, could could go wrong. Well, I think the hardest thing is training as as bow hunters, right? Training ourselves to think more than just where I hit, right? Mm -hmm. So. In, in a lot, at least in my mind, right? I'm thinking um, from the time the arrow is released to where my impact is, right? That, I mean, that in itself is the accuracy I was taught as a bow hunter, as an archer. And it's super important. I mean, not, you have super to. Super important. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter what your penetration is, you hit it in the guts, you're screwed. Yeah. Um, that said, what happens thereafter is usually an afterthought. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, whether it's, it doesn't matter what broadhead, like we, yeah, we well, shoot, like accuracy without penetration is, is useless, you know, and, and vice sure. versa. And we've, and we, you know, I've, I've had those situations, um, wide boy, but yeah. that's in this pal. I mean, that, that should have been a dead deer, but I hit square knuckle of that femur bone and arrow bounced right off of them. Mm -hmm. You know, had it been per what Troy was talking about there, I'm, I, again, I don't know. Cause I don't shoot it. I get, Guess, Almost for sure. Guess it was just buttered through him or bo uh, yeah. broke it and uh, ate him up. I, even with this, with the setup you're shooting now. Yeah, you know, probably. E even with a mechanical broad, I still bet you would have killed that deer. Yeah. So it, it's hard because um, completely agree with everything they're talking about. Um, it's hard for me to retrain my thought process of, of you know, I shoot right behind the shoulder on a deer. Like that's my aiming is the crease. Like that's where I shoot. What would you have to retrain? What do you mean? Well, I mean, in, in their case, it's to shoot through the scapula, shoot through the shoulder. Oh, sure. So you're shooting more forward on that deer. 
Yeah, I'd agree with that. I mean, most a lot of the vitals are protected by the, the shoulder. You know, I mean, think about oh, that's you what know, I do. Here I, I hold buck, for buck, the shoulder, buck, buck, quarter and away, crease up in the cavity. A quarter and away is still better. You know, it's less to get through to get to the same vitals. Yeah, and so and again, even thinking like that longer, sharper, I would assume that decreases, you know, entry wound and exit wound which decreases the amount of blood I'm going to find. Now, I'm not saying that's not going to kill the animal because it will, mm -hmm. but we talk a lot about blood trails and, you know, you can't f you kill them if you can't find them type of thing. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it, and we didn't really talk about it a whole lot on the podcast, but but I'm still, I'm not, it sounds funny coming from me, like I still think there's a such thing as overkill. Sure. You know, it's like that's, and we I, we kind of started on it. Like m maybe we'll we'll get on it again at some point. But like I was asking with with the Ashby studies and stuff, is like, is there a setup that gives you a hundred percent of success as far as a pass through, like every single time? If so, how much how much margin of success do you have there? Can I back that off and introduce something that's going to give me a better blood like an drop? offset? Yeah. Because yeah. the reality is, like, dude, if I could pass through, uh, let's just say a, a white-tailed deer, right? It's the most uh, it's our most common target. I can pass through it a hundred percent of the time and cut the thing in half. I'm going to choose that over, yeah. over something that passes through a hundred percent of the time and just leaves a pinhole. Well, yeah. I right? mean, for everything we're just talking about, if, if there was a rage tripan that was 200 grain, I would shoot it. Yeah. Well, and there's other disadvantages to a, a mechanical broadhead. Sure. I'm just, yeah. In terms of like the, the velocity that's lost, you know, that the energy that's transferred in different directions. Like there, there's no doubt when it comes to penetration, a fixed blade is going to win a hundred percent of the time. Absolutely. There's it, no doubt. Yeah. Agree. There's no doubt. And, and durability for sure. Maybe the most important thing. Yeah. You're, reshooting you're, that You're thing. not going to beat a fixed blade broadhead from, from that regard. Yeah. But, you know, there it's that margin of like, you know, if, yeah. if I can get a pass through 100% of the times, how how great is that yeah. margin? Instead of 650, can I go to 550? Yep. And well, and that's more of a drop. That's yeah. a, that's a yardage thing. Yep. Yeah, because I now I've got more yardage. That, that's where. Where's that, my offset there? You know, in yeah. terms of what else do I? What do I need to add? Do I need to add more weight, or or uh, you know, do I need to change the way that I'm I'm shooting that arrow? Do I have to change spine? Like where, where's it's all the a factor? It's all a factor for sure. I mean, I think if you can equip yourself with the dead, deadliest, uh, <laughs> you know, stuff has to work. Like I, I, one thing I wholeheartedly agree on is like a heavy spine. I think that's yeah, which will be the first thing I do with these new bows. But and, I'm sorry, but okay. but you you know, with more spine comes more weight. Yeah, and you don't. So now I've got to put more weight up front to get. I mean, they're talking and they more weight up front with more weight on your arrow means you need to shoot. A heavier poundage to keep keep yep. your arrow groupings, you know. At yeah. Otherwise, distances. at forty, I'm here, and it's a giant job down to sixty. Yeah. So that's and that's I said at the beginning of the podcast. I don't know that there is a one perfect right answer, like a hundred percent of the time. It's just it's too situational based. I mean, yeah. it's no different than <clears throat> we we build an all around setup. But if let's say we were to you know go into this heavier arrow, um, you know, super high FOC. For a whitetail, that would have to be a completely different setup than when we go to North Dakota and hunt muleys, mm -hmm. because if of I need, yeah, because if I need to take a sixty or seventy yard shot out there, there's no way that setup is going to perform like I need it to perform in that setting. Yeah, well, and the thing that's really not, you know, and I know, you know, Troy's and and Daryl's, their focus is so, and he said it, it's like it's on penetration and like penetration alone. I feel that there's a lot that happens, you know, in, in that the first part of that, which is getting it from the arrow. Mm. Um, there is, and we covered that. The oscillation of the arrow well, under not spining. Just that, but do you think about how much a moving target, a living animal can move from the time that you shoot your bow to the time it reaches it there? We talked about that with Carl. And if you don't have accuracy, it's like I said, you know, accuracy without penetration is worthless and, and vice versa. So if I if my arrow is going to penetrate like literally the earth that the deer <laughs> is standing on, yeah, but... Shit. By the time it gets there from when I shot it, it, it completely ducked or, or whatever happened. Yeah, and I put it in the gut. It's useless. Yep. It's useless. So you, you have to find a happy medium, you know. Ultimately, you, you, you got to be confident. Well, and these guys your... stayed it right. You know, they're they're doing it. It's a lab setting. Like, it, it, when they go out and kill these pigs, and it's it's not hunting. It's a, it's a test. They're mm -hmm. testing these things for durability, for ultimate durability to say this. Now, that said, is that exactly what you need to go kill a deer? No. Kill a deer with a fill point if you want to. It's just they're pushing these things to the boundaries to understand 
these are the factors and these are the keys that seem to lead to that 100% fatality based on placement again. Um, but then take that with a grain of salt and figure out what's going to match your own setting and what you need. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think you can find a happy medium there. I yeah. don't think that it's 380 grain arrows. No. You know. I agree. That that's not the happy that that was what we all shot probably at one point. That's not what you're shooting anymore. Uh, we it has evolved to FOC and things like that. Doesn't mean that you can't throw a hundred grain expandable on the front and smack the hell out of deer. Um, but you just have to if you have that hundred grain expandable on a three hundred eighty grain arrow, you're not going to get much penetration. Yeah. Well, the, the the reality is like you know, in learning from guys like this, like as much as we talk about or think about it, strategize, like to, to shoot deer, like how, how many deer do you and I really shoot a year? Um, couple, a handful, right? Yeah. And these, these guys, you know, and whoever it else every day. testing, it's like it's daily like probably hundreds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we're doing a that, of, that a is, lot of experience that is the one thing that. I will say when you talk about durability and all this stuff, it's like, I'm pro if, if that one arrow and one broadhead does its job, it basically goes on the shelf anyways. Like if I shoot a mature buck like that, that's not saying I won't use reuse an arrow or a broadhead because I will. I I usually don't reuse a lot of the. But the only pans. reason is because they're not re. Yeah, you're not going to reuse a, yeah, the a trash. Braid. But the broad the my arrows are always good. Yep. I I reuse them all the time. Yep. But so like I understand the durability of like once it's sharp, it should stay sharp through the cut. But I mean, mm -hmm. I get that again. It's a it's a deer versus a hog. Big difference, I think, oh, versus sure. a buffalo. Well, and that's that's the the discussion around like the uh, you know overkill. No, overkill is it's not overkill. Part. It's just there are there's a wide variety of heads that you can kill with. Oh yeah, using yeah. the same principles they're applying there. Um, sure. So yeah, I think I think that's kind of where it is. But uh, it it'll be good. We're, we're gonna get these new Hoyts in. Uh, it'll be a perfect time for us to kind of break down and maybe recalculate some things on our own arrows. Maybe I'll get my scale out and actually weigh my arrow. I know I have I mine. Know, it's, I, I think can. it's like still in the box, like sitting there. Um, you know, do some bear shaft, you know, knock tuning. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it'll just be, it's a good time to kind of look at it from a reset. Um, do I think I'll shoot a 700 grain arrow? No. Um, but you know, maybe I go from 485 to 585. And, you know, put more weight up front and get to 19 plus on an FOC because I think I'm in like the 15s right now. Mm -hmm. So hard to say, but uh, cool. Again, from practical use, pushing the boundaries, that's what those guys are doing. Now take that and apply it to your own setting is the way I would look at it. Absolutely. So, uh, okay, well, that's it. I need to go make sure my kids aren't killing them. They're in, in studio, but not in studio, probably beating the hell out of each other out there. And uh, we will see you all next week. Later. It's take me. Oh.